Welcome everyone, I'm Spiro, joined with the founder and editor of NewsBud, Sabelle Edmonds. Hello everyone. Recently, we did a report on the Wagner Group. It's a private military contractor group. It's sort of like the Russian version of Blackwater operating inside Syria. And wouldn't you know it, just a couple days ago, one of the journalists, one of the top journalists who's been covering the Wagner Group, a Russian journalist, uh, was found dead inside Russia. And the other, another journalist, a guy who broke the story on Wagner, he's on the run. He's in hiding. Did they work together, these two journalists, Russian journalists? I don't think so. They worked for different publications. Okay, and these were the two journalists who actually exposed this story? Because it's a massive story. Because as we know, it's illegal in Russia to have mercenaries and the private military contractors. And they have been trying to cover these things up. As you know, initially, they even denied any Russians dying during that strike. Then later they came and they said the Russians, they said, oh, actually, yes, there were these Russians, but they were not uh, involved with our military or with our government. And now they're even back peddling there, too. But these two journalists with two different publications inside Russia, they were the ones who exposed the story. Uh, the one the one journalist, his name is Karatkov. He broke the story on the Wagner Group back in 2013. He works for uh, Fontaka. It's a Russian news publication, and so he's been reporting on him for a long time. He's a former police officer. He lived in Russia, and uh, he was receiving threats uh, recently, as recently as last year, uh, threats directed towards him. And so he's basically fled Russia at this point. He's in hiding somewhere, uh, presumably in Europe, but we don't know, obviously, because he's in hiding. Now, what the interesting thing is, is... This guy has been reporting on the Wagner Group for about five years. So why all of a sudden the threats are coming in now, right? Uh, so I was reading an interview that he gave, and he was saying that before, whenever he would report on the Wagner Group, like you said, it's illegal, it's not supposed to be happening, right, in, in Russia. Well, the authorities would just deny that Wagner even existed. Well, recently he was able to obtain some documents, actual physical documentation of specific Wagner mercenaries. So having this documented evidence, he believes, is the reason behind these threats against him. So what I don't understand is it was exposed in 2013. That's what you're saying here. What I don't understand, why we didn't hear about it all the way till about like a few weeks ago. Why the Western media, you would think they would dive into the story and say, oh, look, Russians are doing it as well. But we, we didn't hear about this whole Russian mercenary groups and the private contractors business up until a month ago. Did they give any explanation why the story went totally hushed in, in, in the West? Well, uh, no, it's an interesting point. I'm glad you brought it up. I think, uh, I think both sides probably have uh, knowledge of covert operations being conducted out can, being conducted by the other side. And uh, I don't know why, but it seems like they're both kind of just sit on the information. I don't know if it's because if one side starts publishing information about the other side, then they're going to retaliate and, you know, uh, start to expose each other's operations. I'm not sure about that. And the other thing uh, I have a question on, because I don't know the case as well as you know, but um, you said as early as 2013. So this mercenary group was established by then. But where were they? Because I don't believe Russians really went in there that deep into Syria, getting really hands-on involved till like 2015, 2016. So what, what was this, this mercenary company doing for the Russian government and what part of the world? Well, uh, this, this Wagner group uh, was founded by a former Russian special forces guy. But since it's, you can't have private armies in Russia, they, were, they founded the company in Argentina. But they were conducting operations in the Ukraine. Yeah, they bring in uh, ex-Russian military guys, ex-Special Forces guys, as well as Ukrainian nationals. And they were involved in the conflict that, took, that was going on for years there in, uh, in the Ukraine. That's where they're, they're mainly known for their operations is the Ukraine and then now Syria. A lot of the uh, people who were fighting in Ukraine actually have since traveled to Syria. And, I mean, they're hired guns at this point. So the journalist's death, is it being investigated in Russia right now as we speak? Yes, it is. Uh, now, the, 
the journalist, he died on April 15th, just a couple days ago, and uh, he died after being in a coma for a few days. Uh, as we said, he, he fell off his balcony, is what uh, investigators are saying. They're, they're saying that it's either an accident or a suicide at this point. They're saying there's no evidence of foul play, and they believe that's because the door was locked from the inside and there was no sign of a struggle. Now... That just, uh, sure. The, the story receives coverage, their expose, their report, suddenly internationally. It brings the Russian government to this point where they even have to come out and kind of semi-admit. And then lo and behold, we have a journalist uh, dying, mysteriously falling down from his whatever floor uh, apartment building flat in, in Russia. And we have the other journalists receiving all these threats. And he has to basically leave Russia and go and find some place to hide. So I would say accident, not very likely. But also, if you go and look at the track records of Putin, Russia, with assassinating and, and murdering journalists, you are you're going to be looking at a very, very nasty, nasty list. We're going to be providing, of course, our viewers with a list of uh, articles and reports. And some of these reports, they are listing all the investigative journalists, the good ones. OK, the good ones in Russia who have been assassinated and uh, poisoned um one of the most famous case that I was following years ago, this would be about 12 years ago, was the case of uh, Anna Politkovskaya. And this lady, this journalist was a was one of those bulldog journalists in Russia. And, and in 1990s and early 2000s, she did some amazing work in Russia, uh, exposing corruption within uh, Putin's administration. She was covering, heavily covering the uh, uh, Chechnya conflict and a lot of uh, human rights abuses by Russia uh, targeting the uh, Chechen uh, minority uh, in the region. And this woman, she was uh, threatened with rape. And this is by Putin's forces. Uh, she, they, a couple of times they tried to poison her. And then finally, in 2006, as she was, and we are talking about Anna Politkovskaya. And again, we're going to be providing these links. As she was writing a book exposing Putin and his uh, oligarch uh, private group with, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars and their corruption cases and FSB, she uh, was murdered. Uh, she was assassinated inside the elevator in her Moscow apartment. So she went into the elevator and someone got in there right behind her. And, and that person, the assassin, shot her four times, twice in the chest, once in the head. And they killed her. They assassinated her. And even though, and another interesting thing here is this happened on the birthday of Putin. And up until that point, like this journalist you mentioned, Spiro, she kept telling people that she was getting death threats from FSB, from certain military operatives in Russia, and, uh, and, and that she was concerned for her life. But most importantly, she was saying that she was concerned for the lives of uh, her uh, sources, her informants who were giving her all this information, documented information in Russia. And uh, I, want, I, have to, I have to read this paragraph and this is shortly before uh, uh, she was assassinated in Russia. She's saying here, we are hurtling back into a Soviet abyss, into an information vacuum that spells death from our own ignorance. All we have left is the internet, where information is still freely available. For the rest, if you want to go on working as a journalist, it's a total servility to Putin. Otherwise, it can be death, the bullet, poison, or trial, whatever our special services, Putin's guard dogs, see fit. 
And she delivered the speech before uh, CPJ or one of the uh, journalistic organizations international. And, uh, and, and, and shortly after, she was assassinated inside her own elevator. And of course, they caught some patsy uh, uh, people there. They put them in jail. Then they said the statute of limitation was up and they never found out who ordered the assassination. And the fact that it was carried out as she was writing an expose, a book on, on Putin, as she was writing that book, she got assassinated on Putin's birthday. And uh, there are dozens. Uh, as I said, we're gonna be providing the links for our readers, for our viewers, and uh, they can take a look at all these unsolved cases of dozens of journalists, the real journalists being poisoned, being gone down uh, in Russia since Putin came in pa into power around uh, early 2000. And the list is mind boggling. Another famous case is uh, Igor Domnikov. And again, he was a Russian journalist and editor for special topics involving business corruption. And he was also pursuing uh, some of Putin's connections. And he was murdered in 2000. And I have to read it here. Uh, although some individuals were convicted of the attack in 2007, the suspected mastermind, Sergei Dorovsky, an ex-government official from Lipetsk region, was never convicted as the statute of limitation on the case had expired. Of, of course, I mean, you see that as a repeating theme. Uh, Domnikov was attacked outside of his Moscow apartment. See, that's interesting. The journalist we are talking about, the new case, it's from his own apartment unit. Then we had, of course, uh, Anna's murder assassination in the apartment in Moscow inside the elevator. And same thing with Ior Domnikov. And uh, by several men wielding hammers, Domnikov was hit on the head repeatedly, which knocked him unconscious. Due to the injuries sustained in the initial beating, Ior was sent to Bordenko Institute, where he remained in a coma until his death. Two months later, nobody really got truly convicted of this crime. They never found out who ordered the hit. I think this is a very important topic to talk about in more macro terms because we all know that uh, uh, we are seeing less and less uh, real investigative journalists. You know, the ones working with the mainstream media, they have to maneuver within the parameters established by the government, by the deep state. And then we also have tons of junks. I'm saying it again, junk, junky uh, outlets that, that they're not really engaged in journalism, actual journalism. What they do is basically they take, cut and paste other people's work or they just sit down and write fictions. Uh, I'm not saying they're all bad. There are some really good, solid alternative journalists um, as well. Uh, we have them. But Russia is not behind the U.S. when it comes to threatening journalists, assassinating them, and basically quashing any dissent or real investigative journalism work. Not only that Russia is not behind, I would, say, I would say Russia is way ahead of the United States. I mean, how many cases can we think of here in the United States of investigative journalists? Granted, we don't have many of them who are willing to truly challenge the deep state and the government who have had, um, you know, questionable um, murders or deaths. I mean, I can think of, of, four, of course, Michael Hastings case. And you mentioned before we started recording, Gary Webb's case still is, a, is, is right in the middle because he shot himself for his suicide twice and twice in the head before he completed that suicide mission and he died. Uh, but when you compare it with Putin and Russia, uh, well, you're looking at maybe six times, 10 times, 20 times more in terms of actually going, threatening and assassinating journalists. And with that, um, at this point, I think we should ask those people who have rabies and they're like side takers. I don't know why it's so popular here in the US. Everything is treated like a football team. You either take this side and then cheer only for this side and boo and attack the other side, or you do it the other way around. You do one side. 
where does it come from? It's truly mind boggling. It's very rare to, to come across people who sit in the middle, they observe, they criticize when there are things to criticize on each side and stay kind of neutral. But no, we have this, we must have teams. I am taking a team. And now we are seeing this major uh, divide among this pro-Russian uh, or the pro-U.S. government or pro-West uh, of uh, fronts. And, and in the West, so uh, they're like, everything Putin does, great, hooray, woo, let's cheer everyone. And uh, everything West does is absolutely awful or switch them around. RT, for example, are you going to see any of these murder stories, assassinations, inv investigations by state-owned publications in Russia, such as Sputnik, such as RT? such as Pravda. Have you seen many stories investigating these cases, uh, Spiro, on RT, let's say the popular one? Uh, it's interesting you mentioned that. No, I, I haven't, but I, I haven't specifically looked. Uh, after we, we get done here, uh, I'm gonna go ahead and search both of those sites. There may be, because it's receiving international coverage, there may be a little headlines there saying it's under investigations. But as far as investigative journalism is concerned, absolutely. I, I am ready to wage a bet here. I'm not a gambling woman, but I am ready to wage a bet that we will not find any thorough investigative reporting on these cases because it didn't happen with any of the other cases. There are dozens of journalists and these journalists, none of them were with RT. None of them were with Sputniks. These were with smaller journalistic organizations. And these were the real investigative journalists, I would say more independent, who were looking into corruption, uh, malfeasance, all sorts of malpractices by Putin's administrations, whether it's military, whether it's FSB, their intelligence services. See, you will never find those on RT. RT, they, they want to put the focus on our crap. Excuse my language. This is what U.S. is doing. And, and sometimes they do good work. I'm not saying they don't do good work, but their whole uh, guideline says thou shall not report on the stuff that are negative and bad on Russia. Well, then what's the difference? Really, what is the difference between the mainstream media in the U.S. we are attacking, or U.K., and the Russian mainstream media? Do you see any difference here? Well, no, and they're not going to bite the hand that feeds them. Uh, you know, they are being uh, sponsored, uh, funded by the government. Uh, like you said, it's a state-sponsored program, just like many of the, the Western programming here. Uh, it's all... They have an agenda, and it's and it's apparent, and it's obvious. And like you said, they're gonna they're not going to do anything unless they're forced to, unless they have to, uh, you know. And then they'll kind of dance around it at best. But uh... well, the same thing I'm seeing during the wartime reporting by RT, and that is, for example, when our awful strikes kill 150 civilians, it is right there front page RT headline bold, U.S. strike calls 150 deaths, civilian deaths. Here are the pictures of the children. That's awful. And, 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 and I'm not saying it's inaccurate reporting. It's accurate. Now, <laughs> it's interesting because when the Russian forces, uh, let's say accidentally even, they cause deaths in hospitals, uh, civilian casualties, and there was a recent 132 people died as a result of Russian airstrike. Again, I'm not saying it was purposefully hitting the civilians there. You couldn't find anything on the front page of RT or Sputnik. And even some of the other publications, it would be like on B12 pages. It's never there as the headlines. And it's so important for people to keep this in mind, okay? Trying to get informed, as hard as it may be, with all the information bombardment we have, taking sides and say, I'm going to buy into everything this publication or this country or this president says, and I'm not going to listen to anything this other, you know, publication from this other country says, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's just the path towards complete ignorance. And it just uh, fosters bias. 
and that's what it does. And uh, that's one of the things we don't do. Our subscribers, our viewers who follow my aggregated news that I publish several times a week, 30 plus links, they see that I do have uh, some articles from our team, and these are good articles. Uh, they are talking about uh, the the currency war between China, Russia, and the U.S., or they are talking about you know a, a certain whistleblower from U.S. that doesn't get any coverage, who doesn't get any coverage here. I cover Sputnik, I cover RT, I pick some articles from Guardians that are legit, but I don't do this game of. I'm going to broadcast, we're going to broadcast that news, but everything Russia, because Putin is the hero. That's another thing, this hero finding complex that people have in the West. Well, I mean, you know, between that and like you're saying, the polarization, which we are, we are seeing on a scale I don't think we've seen before. Uh, it's just, everything's just growing exponentially, especially when you take into consideration uh, the internet and social media and how all this information spreads so quickly. But uh, I think it really boils down to social engineering. I mean, we are uh, bombarded with uh, these choices. You have to choose a side, Sabelle. Do you like Coke or Pepsi? Do you like, you know, Republicans or Democrats, left, right? I mean, you know, I mean, I understand that, you know, everything in the universe has an opposite, you know, but I mean, at the same time, they're, they're trying so hard to get us uh, to have that wedge in between us. It's the divide and conquer strategy, and it's working beautifully. Absolutely. And, you know, it's a very lonely place, our position, being in the middle not being Republican or Democrats, as you said, not being liberal or this, not being pro-Putin, we die for you, we love you, Putin, or oh, we are so pro-Trump. That just tells you how little the base is. Because look, we cover something on, on uh, let's say, uh, President Trump, okay, whether it's Kurt Nemo or one of our other producers. And then we get these people who cancel subscriptions. They're like, Oh, I thought you guys love, you know, MAGA and Trump. I can't believe you just criticized them. Damn you. We are leaving you. And we go like, okay, bye-bye. Hasta la vista, baby. And then uh, a week later, we are doing something and we are exposing Putin. Uh, I like it how Professor Kovacevic refers to him as the oligarch of all oligarchs. And the way he puts it, you know, he has uh, he has lived in Russia. He has thought in Russia. He has uh, gotten degrees there. But when he gives his analysis, he's not kissing Putin's butt. Because once then we take sides, then even when we see things that we agree it's wrong, it's like, I don't want to eat crow. You know, I'm, I'm going to still stand by what I said. So uh, we don't want to do that. We don't do that. Uh, I had a couple of people from the uh, hater side uh, saying, oh, Sibel Edmonds is uh, is saying RT is bad because she's not giving uh, being given prominence in RT. And one of the things we are going to do here is uh, I have collected all the invites I have received from RT in the past two and a half years. And this is more than a dozen of email invitations asking me to give interviews, asking me to provide analysis. In the past two and a half, three years, I have been rejecting all the interview requests. I don't have anything against RT saying, oh, they are evil. As I said, they do some good work. One reason for that is the time limitation. I mean, we are running our own news organizations and it's so hard for us to even find time to do our own recording and, and report on our own investigative work. But the other reason is, especially since we are covering Syria and some of these issues, I am not going to go on RT because it's extremely biased. OK, it is 100 percent state owned. They report directly to Kremlin. They can't report anything that Kremlin doesn't put the stamp of approval. I don't go on uh, NPR either. I don't accept any interview requests. Now, I don't get dozens of interview requests from Fox News. But even when I get it, I politely I say, um, no, thank you. I don't have time. And right now, I don't want to provide interviews or analysis for your publication. Again, I'm not saying they are evil. All I'm saying is 
I, I, um, and, and as you see, these emails, they come every time there is an issue on Turkey, on Syria, on whistleblowers, on police state practices here in, in the U.S. These are the areas within, you know, my uh, um, expertise to a certain degree. So they reach out and I'm thankful and I'm grateful, but I decline. So uh, putting this thing and saying, oh, poo-pooing because, because they don't give any prominence to news, but... I hope we can go ahead and put that straight out there, too. I have declined dozens of uh, interview requests by RT. And the fact that as Newsbud, we do not take sides, okay? Um, I don't think any decent journalistic channel can report really good without, uh, with, by taking sides because that is called bias. And of course, there are different levels of bias, extreme level of bias, milder level of bias, but we don't do that. And uh, as, as I was saying, you will not see investigative journalists from Russia who can provide reports freely, including what happened with what we've seen with Wagner groups, because if there are, they're going to get killed. Uh, and you will see that in some of the uh, links that we provide, poisoning, um, bullets uh, being thrown down, balconies uh, being beaten to death with pipes. Uh, but it, it just doesn't happen. You can't engage in investigative journalism inside Russia. And anyone who wants to come and say that is wrong, I will show them the lists. I will show now almost a thick encyclopedia of what happens to any journalist who tries, who even attempts to engage in investigative journalism? Yeah, I mean, uh, Russia has the highest uh, body count, uh, if you want to call it that, of, of investigative journalism. Of course, there is, you know, they, I'm sure they haven't gotten all of them. I'm sure there's still people in Russia doing good, good work. Uh, it's very dangerous, very risky. Uh, I mean, it's one of the most dangerous countries to do journalism in, and it's not even a, a war country. <laughs> I mean, there's no current war taking place same there. Thing, right same thing with Turkey as well. You know, yes. we, since the attempted coup, I believe several hundred journalists have been jailed in, in Turkey. Now, it's, uh, it's, it's turning into this witch hunt saying, if I don't like your writing, if you're engaging in some sort of a criticism, I'm going to say you are a Gulenist. And how many of these cases are actually Gulenist cases? Are there hundreds of journalists? I doubt it. But uh, I have to say in the Middle East, it's the most dangerous job. Uh, I wanted to study journalism when I was in high school. And my mother and her family size, they said, absolutely not over our dead bodies, because uh, considering your fire, passion, journalism, I mean, you wouldn't even last one year. They would take you out. Um, and, and in the Middle East, I can't think of a single country where you have independent journalism or unbiased journalism, especially if the, if the topic is turning inward towards your government, towards your military, towards your uh, intelligence agency. Oh, well, they say that, uh, you know, the old saying goes, the pen is mightier than the sword and uh, information is power. Knowledge is power. And, uh, and these governments know that. That's why they engage in their psychological operations. That's why they engage in their disinformation and misinformation campaigns. And they actually, uh, you know, control the narrative. They have people, I mean, it's been well documented and established places like the Washington Post, the New York Times. I mean, they all, you know, they work directly with intelligence agencies and... Uh, you know, believe it if you want if, when they tell you that it's for your own good, for national security. I, I don't want my news source coming from any government. I don't care what government it is because to, they're all corrupt. No government is perfect in this country, you know, or in this world, excuse me. And uh, that's why journalism, journalists are needed, really, to be the watchdogs of those governments. And, of course, yes, they have been persecuted. Um, you know, you, you mentioned uh, before about that one Russian woman journalist who was targeted in her ele elevator. You know, this seems to be one of their tactics, modus operandi, for Russia. Like, you know, this other journalist, uh, Bor Borodin, targeted in his home. He even called a colleague of his the day or two before saying, hey, there's guys in masks and camouflage running around my apartment, apartment complex. You know, I, I mean, and next thing you know, a day or two later, he's thrown off his, or falls off his balcony. 
you know, uh, and, and this, the, the, the guy Korotkov who broke the Wagner story, he was, his address was being published online and he said in his interview that he didn't want to be beat over the head in front of his apartment. I mean, so it's like they're, they're all, you know, they know the risks and, and this guy, he, he took, he, he fled Russia. So I've actually uh, tried to contact him, but it's, it's hard to uh, get a hold of someone who doesn't want to be found. <laughs> I'm still puzzled though, Spiro. I'm really puzzled why US was not all over of this 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 mercenary group being exposed. To me, that's like a major question mark. And as an analyst, that's the first and then I get obsessed. I'm like, I have to find out there is something that doesn't add up. You know, when Russians do anything wrong, we are like broadcasting, bashing them nonstop. Nothing. It's like not a peep on this. That's weird. That's unusual it is especially when you take into consideration uh you know the their own saying never let a good crisis go to waste kind of a thing or or you know i mean of course they're going to take every opportunity they can to capitalize uh, on a, a opportunity to, to make russia look bad i mean that's what the u.s yes. wants that's all they want to do so it is strange I, I and i'm thinking that it's because uh there may be some kind of uh, informal agreements like, hey, if you expose our operations, we're going to expose your operations. And then where does it end, I guess? I mean, at that point. Uh, but That's true. That's true. Because uh, uh, during some of us, uh, our roundtables, I brought up the fact that Putin has so much intelligence on Operation Gladio B. Because FSB through Chechens that they capture, etc., they have been gathering so much information, but it's been like hush hush. You don't see Putin or Russian publications actually airing a real dirty uh, uh, laundry out there. So now I think what you're saying is plausible here. That 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 is a, a mutual agreement of let's not expose too many of our deep shits on either side. I, mean, I, I can see that. Yeah, it's almost like a, you know blackmailing each other or something. <laughs> but uh, uh, you know, and another interesting point that I was thinking about too. Okay, with this journalist, uh, this Russian journalist Borodin, who who fell off his balcony and and died. Uh, Yes, you're right. There has been international coverage of this. Okay, so that to me almost raises suspicion. And I'm not trying to be a conspiracy theorist or anything here, but we did just see the whole Scripple incident take place where it looks like the Western intelligence services were trying to frame Russia for the attempted assassination using um, a chemical weapon. So, you know, could a Western intelligence service potentially have targeted this guy in, a, in another way to make Russia look bad? I mean, I, you can't rule it out at this point. No, you can't rule anything out. Sometimes it gets so twisted uh, that, that, that um, it becomes a conspiracy of facts, you know? True. Well, uh, you know, it's it's definitely tra tragic to see. We never like to see uh, anyone, you know, in, put in this position and, and his family and, and his friends had come out online talking about how he has been attacked previously. Like uh, this one journalist, Borodin, the guy who just died from the balcony fall, uh, his friends came out on Facebook saying that he was just attacked earlier this month, 10 days before he died. Physical attack or was it like verbal? Physically attacked, he was hospitalized and 10 days before he died, uh, right in front of his apartment building. He was like at his apartment building, he gets attacked and hospitalized. And then just six months ago in October, he was knocked over the head with a, a steel pipe. So this guy has been targeted before. Uh, he was obviously nervous. He had these masked men running around his building on his balcony with a weapon. You know, so, and then all of a sudden he falls. I just can't believe, well, no, I can't. And you can't call the police in Russia. Because most of the times those masked men are either FSB or certain military group or within Russia or it's the police. You know, it's I know how that feels, you know, same thing in, as I said, countries I have lived in Middle East. It's the same thing. You the last place you want to call is the police department because. Those people under covered by the mask usually are part of the uh, police department, and uh, that's that's very unfortunate. Well, let's keep an eye on this, and please keep us uh, up to date on how it goes with this mercenary group. I hope to see more uh, on the case because uh, we had some initial reports coming out. We covered it. 
And now with the recent uh, tragic developments with the, with the two journalists, we may get maybe uh, additional other journalists start looking. I'm sure it's not going to be from Russia, most likely, but uh, internationally. So we'll keep an eye on this topic. We'll keep an eye on everything. And uh, for those of you who haven't seen the Wagner Report yet, it's, uh, it's available right now for members at newsblood.com. Thank you, Sabel, for taking the time uh, to, to join me on this report today. Well, actually, thank you for putting this together for us. It's a, it's a very important topic and it's very topical. And I'm hoping that since it is, it does involve journalists, their lives, that other people will start paying attention. I'm hoping that more people in Russia would start raising hell. And uh, with that, uh, we want to thank our viewers and we want to thank our community of subscribers who have made these programs possible. And I want to put it out there. Uh, we have uh, expanded our uh, subscription base in the past two, three months, and we are looking to hire part-time investigative journalists. So any of you who is interested and uh, unbiased, uh, Nonpartisan types of reporting, uh, you can contact us through Newsbot. There's a contact page there. Send us your resume, a few paragraphs about you, and uh, we would like to hear from you and expand our stellar team here. The use of private military contractors, or PMCs, by the United States has been heavily documented and even glorified. The U.S. government began what is known as outsourcing back in the 1970s by hiring contractors for U.S. military transports during the Vietnam War. Since then, the private military industrial complex has exploded into a multi-billion dollar a year industry whose services have been employed not only by governments, but also private corporations, humanitarian groups, NGOs, and the United Nations, just to name a few. The evolution of private military contractors has reshaped the battlefield, allowing corporations to transcend many government restrictions including any bureaucratic processes or political roadblocks while providing governments with the safety buffer of plausible deniability, removing any accountability from the equation while simultaneously blurring the lines of sovereignty for other nations. Private contractors have been referred to as mercenaries or hired guns, and most people have heard of the infamous Blackwater Group and its founder, Eric Prince. But not many people are aware of the Wagner Group, which is allegedly a Russian private military contractor. In this Newsbud report, we will examine what has been referred to as Putin's shadow army and Putin's ghost soldiers, who played a significant role in the Ukraine conflict, downing a Ukrainian military plane full of paratroopers, carrying out combat operations and conducting assassinations. This shadow army is currently on the ground inside Syria, but the Russian government is denying any involvement, as private armies are outlawed in Russia. Did Russia take a page out of the U.S. covert war playbook and deploy a secret army inside Syria, in direct violation of Russian law? If so, this could mean serious legal trouble for high-ranking Russian officials, including President Vladimir Putin himself. You will not see this on your evening news as the controlled Russian press is just as bad and just as corrupt as the Western media. So go to newsbud.com to see the full report as we examine the alleged connections between these ghost soldiers and the Russian government and their covert war that has already resulted in deadly direct military exchanges between the United States and its proxies with this shadow army inside Syria. Plus, find out how the U.S. is combating this new opponent on and off the battlefield. The full report is exclusively available right now for members at newsbud.com.